Welcome everyone to Wednesday Night at the Lab. I'm Tom Zinnan. I work here at the UW-Madison Biotechnology Center. I also work for the Division of Extension, Wisconsin 4-H. And on behalf of those folks and our other co-organizers, PBS Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, and the UW-Madison Science Alliance, thanks again for coming to Wednesday Night at the Lab. We do this every Wednesday night, 50 times a year. Tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce to you Hannah Hacker and Emily Tyner. They're both with the University of Wisconsin Green Bay, and they're going to speak with us about the Green Bay Estuary Digital Archives Collection. Hannah Hacker was born in Baraboo, Wisconsin, and went to Wisconsin Dells High School. Then she went to UW Green Bay and majored in both creative writing and arts management. She also got a master's in library and information sciences from the University of Iowa. Emily Tyner was born in Detroit, Michigan and went to Huron High School in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Then she went to Smith College in Massachusetts where she studied both biology and education. She's received her master's degree from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee School of Freshwater Sciences where she is there a PhD candidate still. And would you please join me in welcoming both Hannah Hacker and Emily Tyner to Wednesday Night at the Lab. Good evening. Thank you for coming. And I like seeing that Packer shirt in the audience, too. <laughs> We're excited to talk about this project. Uh, I do want to acknowledge our funding sources where Wisconsin Coastal Management Program, the DNR, and the Fund for Lake Michigan. I will dive right in with some project background. In case you aren't familiar, the Green Bay Estuary, it's among the most diverse, productive, and economically thriving freshwater systems in the world. You can see the bigger blue large outline is the Green Bay watershed. And then the smaller green outline is the area fringing the Green Bay Estuary. And that is um, of interest to me in my professional life. I, am, I work at UW-Green Bay as the Director of Freshwater Strategy. My main role in that capacity is I'm leading the designation of Bay of Green Bay National Estuary and Research Reserve, or it's called a NUR. This will be a new entity for the state to study uh, estuaries and coastal processes, to bring in education, stewardship, and training. It's a joint federal-state project. So I've been working on this designation for a couple years, and we're two more years to being complete. But I do a lot of my work focused on the Green Bay estuary. Uh, Northeast Wisconsin and the area around Green Bay has been a uh, testing ground for restoration and conservation planning and implementation over the last few years through actions like the Great Lakes Legacy Act and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Uh, over a billion dollars have been spent in the Green Bay area on the Fox River cleanup, on cleanup of areas of concern, which are federal designations for really hot spots of contamination. There's been edge of field work on agricultural runoff. So there's been a, a big movement towards restoration actions around the Green Bay area, and that's one of the impetuses for this, um, this designation as a significant area of, uh, of estuarian functions. The NUR, which kind of is the uh, umbrella for this work, is a designation that we're pursuing. We'll be joining a national network. This is a NOAA state federal program, and the, the dots on the map there are where all these other reserves exist around the US. There's already, there is one in Wisconsin, in Superior, uh, in Superior, Wisconsin, that's a UW Extension collaboration. This will be the third one in the Great Lakes and the second one for Wisconsin. It is the foundation of reserves, our research, education, stewardship, and training. We, th through this designation process, we just completed our selection of sites, so where we'll do our long-term research and monitoring work within the Green Bay Estuary. The sites that we chose overlap the uh, lower Green Bay area of concern an area of concern, it's AOC, you might be familiar with that term. These are designations across the Great Lakes where there, yeah, there's been harmful legacy pollutants, there's been a lot of effort to clean them up and restore them again. And the areas for this NUR overlap um, the Green Bay area of concern. As part of the, this AOC work and kind of general restoration work across Green Bay, there's a lot of interest in knowing what did these sites look like before they were degraded before there was aquatic invasive species, uh, before they kind of got into the condition they were that we're trying to uh, return to this kind of 
pre, uh, deg this degraded site that was kind of pre-restoration action. And there is this really kind of nested geography of areas of concern, restoration, and the nerve, and where there's conservation actions happening, management um, movements, and a lot of planning activities. So with that in mind, the Wisconsin DNR, and specifically I should say we're also speaking on behalf of our co-collaborators here, Deb Anderson from the archives at UW-Green Bay, and Brie Kupski from the Wisconsin DNR, they had been in conversation for some years to access UW Green Bay's rich archival material that speaks to what did these areas, this, these areas around the estuary look like in the past, and could we kind of get there with restoration action? The archives has a collection of materials about the Green Bay estuary, things like maps and data sets, photos, oral histories, um, interviews, large, large aerial photos, all of those things can be really useful when you're planning restoration and you want to kind of know what your goal, your target is from what, uh, con what condition a site was like in the past. So our colleague Bree at the Wisconsin DNR would work with Deb and would visit the archives frequently to look at some of these uh, cultural stories, these images, these pictures as reference points to understand what, um, how to kind of plan area of concern restoration moving forward. One challenge, though, is that many of these materials were only available if you came to the archives. And she and her project collaborators were looking for more accessibility, potentially digital accessibility, so that they could work from their offices, they could share that information with their partners, it would be a little bit easier to access these, these materials. Uh, the Tank Farm Marsh, which Hannah will speak to, was a particular focus and especially for these kind of historical connections and cultural, this, these cultural histories around it. So with this goal in mind, and besides the DNR, we knew that making the collection more accessible would be a value to researchers because there's been a renewed focus or this intense focus because of the area of concern work and the NER designation. There was just a lot of interest for making these materials more available. And meanwhile, as I was doing work with the, this Green Bay NER designation, I've been looking for kind of a, a holistic way to connect with other areas of campus. Science is really embedded in these designations, these Astorian designations. There's a kind of a science program. It does long-term monitoring. But I was looking for ways to connect with other parts of campus that also have water connections. So the Green Bay NER needs, the archives needs, we kind of came together. We sought out funding from the Wisconsin Coastal Management Program who supported us on a one-year project with ultimately the goal of making this really rich collection um, more searchable, more accessible, and let the broad community know across Green Bay and across the state that there is this rich trove of information about the estuary and to kind of learn what community artifacts exist that we might bring into this collection. We obtained funding and we began work on this project and we brought in Hannah Hacker to lead the project. So I'm gonna hand over the next part of this conversation to Hannah, who will talk to you about the collection, how to access it, what it contains, and hopefully um, encourage you to kind of spur your interest in going to see the collection. And I'll come back on to talk about our future plans and goals for it. All right, thank you, Emily. Um, my name is Hannah Hacker. I am the archives assistant at the UW-Green Bay Archives and Area Research Center. Um, this past year, I took a brief hiatus from my role as archives assistant and took on the role as project coordinator for the Green Bay um, Estuary Digital Archives collection. Um, so now I'm going to dive right in and talk about the collections that are in the um, Green Bay Estuary Digital Archives collection. So this was a really unique digitization project to work on um, because instead of developing it from one physical collection, as many digital collections often are, this project pulled relevant materials from multiple different physical archives collections under one umbrella. And that umbrella was the Green Bay Estuary with a focus on the Bay shoreline and the Fo Lower Bay Fox River area of concern that Emily was talking about earlier. Um, today, I'm going to be going over um, the materials that are currently in the digital collection, roughly in the order that they were digitized. Um, I will also be going over why these collections were chosen for inclusion in the digital collection, and then after that, I'll be doing a demo of it so you guys can see the digital collection itself. So first up, 
was Green Bay's West Shore Coastal Wetlands, A History of Change, which is a dissertation by UW-Green Bay graduate student Timothy Bosley, published in 1976. It examines historical changes to the wetland areas along the west shore of the bay, both natural and human. With the dissertation, Bosley also donated a series of maps and aerials of the West Shore in Brown, Marinette, and O'Connell counties that were used to develop his thesis. The dissertation and the supporting materials are valuable, especially in regards to studying and understanding wetland habitats along the West Shore and what caused them to change over time. Tank Atkinson's farm marsh was a large, significant piece of coastal marshland located along the bay's southwestern shoreline. The marsh was home to a variety of local wildlife, including various species of waterfowl. The Tank Atkinson's farm marsh records contain documents pertaining to an effort put forward by the city of Green Bay to fill the marsh and build rail spurs. The records date from 1971 to 1982 and include initial application, depositions, and hearings, as well as correspondence, publications, and maps. This collection is fascinating in that it not only contains transcripts of the hearings and depositions, but also documents the public's response to the application. There was a lot of pushback against filling the marsh because of its importance as a waterfowl habitat, as well as being a beautiful natural area. Historically, it was also a popular area for locals to hunt and trap. Prior to digitization, this collection was unprocessed and not readily available to researchers. Now, users will have full access to this collection online through this digital collection. The Fort Howard Paper Company was a paper manufacturer well known for their toilet paper <laughs> located in downtown Green Bay along the Fox River. The company's materials are vast and contain a variety of different company records. The digitization primarily focused on aerial views of the company along the river, and those aerials span from the early 1930s through the early 1990s. The aerials show the changes to the river and the impacts the company had on the area prior to the Fox River becoming an area of concern formally in 1987. Also digitized were images of changing water levels, ships making deliveries to the company, and aerials of the mouth of the Fox River along the bay. The SPC, or Special Collections Photo Collection, is a compilation of images and postcards that focus on northeastern Wisconsin. Only photographs and postcards that were relevant to the Green Bay estuary and related waterways were digitized and included in the digital collection. The relevant images date from approximately 1905 to 1976, so one of the strengths of this collection is that it contains very early images of areas of waterways like Sturgeon Bay, the Oconto Peshtigo and Menominee Rivers, Dutchman Creek, the De Pierlock and Dam, and more. Essentially, it provides a variety of early images that covers a broad geographic scope that is relevant to the Green Bay estuary. The 19th century Old Door County settlements are two maps that were produced by UW-Green Bay student Tom Husek in 1991. The maps depict settlements from the 19th century, such as bays, lighthouses, harbors, and lumber communities. Many of these settlements on these maps no longer exist, so it's interesting to see what settlements and industries used to be in Door County along the shore of the bay and Lake Michigan. The maps also describe what the settlements used to look like, how they changed, and why. Prior to digitization, these maps were known to only be available to view at the UW-Green Bay archives, so now they are available to everyone to view at uh, the digital collection. The UW-Green Bay facilities management records pertain to the building and growth of the UW-Green Bay campus, similar to the Fort Howard Record Company um, Fort Howard Company records I was referring to earlier, this is a very large collection that contains a variety of different types of materials. Unfortunately, not all the items that were relevant to the Green Bay estuary were able to be digitized during this first grant period. Um, items include archaeological reports, vegetation and soil studies, environmental impact statements, and more. What was digitized during this grant period were a variety of maps, aerials, and original development and land acquisition drawings dating from the 1960s through the early 1980s. 
These materials not only show the university's early visions and plans for the Bay Shore and the Coffin Memorial Arboretum, but also illustrate the university's early impacts on the area. The Northeastern Wisconsin Aerial Photographs Collection contains aerials taken by the U.S. Department of Agriculture from 1938 through 2000. These aerials focus on land and communities in northeastern Wisconsin, spanning several counties including Brown, Door, Kewanee, Marinette, and more. Digitization focused on images that showed the Green Bay and Fox River watersheds, primarily shorelines and waterways in Brown and Door County. These images record the changes to the waterways and the land over a large span of time. Now that these are digitized, aerials relevant to the Green Bay estuary will be fully discoverable and searchable, not only by county or by year, but by names of specific waterways and locations. And this is actually something I'll be demonstrating later. The Fox Wolf Environmental History Project is a collection that was compiled by UW-Green Bay alum Paul Wozniak, who researched and wrote about local environmental history. The collection contains oral histories, photographs, and research files. For the digital collection, the primary focus was on digitizing and transcribing the oral history interviews in this collection. The interviews provide unique personal stories and experiences about the Bay, as well as the Fox and East Rivers and their tributaries, focusing on what those areas were like back in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Topics of these interviews include pollution, fishing, hunting, trapping, environmental conservation, working at local paper mills, and more. There are a total of 67 interviews in the physical collection, currently on cassette tape and CD. During this past year, 12 of those interviews were digitized and fully transcribed for this digital collection. The transcriptions make the interviews discoverable and keyword searchable. Additionally, a few of the interviews had related photographs that were donated by the interviewees and which are included in the inter along with the interviews in the digital collection. Um, the UW-Green Bay Archives holds two issues of the publication, The State of the Bay, produced by the UW-Green Bay Institute for Land and Water Studies in the 1990s. Each issue provides detailed data on the condition of the Bay and Lake Michigan. They show the work that was being envisioned in the 1990s to improve the water quality in the Bay and the Fox River. Topics in these issues include water quality analyses, historical changes to the water, <coughs> pollution strategies, and more. The Jackie Reimer Ryan films is a very small collection of home movies from the 30s and 40s. They show scenes of the bay in Brown and Door County, depicting various recreational activities such as swimming, boating, and playing on the beach. There's also footage of Mahone Woods, which is now part of the Coffrin Memorial Arboretum at UW-Green Bay. The originals were 16 millimeter film reels, which as you may well guess is an obsolete format. Um, digitization not only allows these films to be discoverable and searchable, but preserves them and allows them to be viewed and appreciated well into the future. In addition to digitizing relevant UW-Green Bay archives collections, we also reached out to the local community for historical materials. We ended up hosting three one-on-one -on -one community scanathons, where we met with donors to gather information about the items that they were donating and then borrowed those items to digitize and add to the collection. The items that were donated to this collection include an 1866 insurance appraisal list that captures information about the ships in the Great Lakes, a variety of photographs spanning from approximately 1925 up to the 2000s, ranging from images of commercial fishing vessels to water skiing on the Fox River to the impact of the Bay of Green Bay flood in 1973 and more. Vintage postcards spanning from approximately 1900 up to the 1990s, showing areas and waterways of interest such as Bay Beach, the Fox and East Rivers, Baird Creek, and more. Six home films, also on 16 millimeter reels, reels um, from the mid 1940s through the mid 1970s, that include fo footage of Point Sobel, Long Tail Point, the Fox River, and the Lower Bay. And now that you're all familiar with the collections included in the Green Bay Estuary Digital Archives collection, here's a material breakdown of what was digitized this past year. 
Um, so nearly 1,000 pages of documents and historical records, ranging from correspondence and publications to scientific data and reports. Over 1,500 individual aerial images and photographs dating from approximately 1,900 to 2,000, depicting natural and historical areas over time. Just over 70 maps showing past settlements and land development plans along the Bay and the Fox River. 12 oral history interviews that tell the personal stories of those who have lived in Green Bay during the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and their experiences with the water, land, wildlife, and industries of the area and nine home films dating from the 1930s through the 1970s with footage of the Bay and the Fox River. Next up, we'll take a look at the Green Bay Estuary Digital Archives collection itself. So give me a moment to get out of this presentation here. All right, so to um, Get to the digital collection, you'll first navigate to the UW-Green Bay Library's website, so you can access that at uwgb.edu backslash library. Um, it is also available on the UW-Green Bay Archives website, which you can access at uwgb.edu backslash archives. Um, so then all you have to do is click on this search and find, navigate to our digital collections at the UW-Green Bay Libraries, and then the Green Bay Estuary Digital Archives collection is right here. So you click on that, and while we're on this about page, I also want to talk for, for a little bit about copyright. So copyright to all the materials in this digital collection belong to the individuals, organizations, or agencies who originally uh, created or own them. Um, so these are shared on the Green Bay Estuary Digital Archives collection for strictly nonprofit educational purposes. Um, so it's basically protected under fair use provisions by the US copyright law. Um, so teachers and students and educators are free to reproduce any document for nonprofit classroom use. However, for any other use, we would appreciate if you reached out to the UW Green Bay Archives at archives at uwgb.edu. And now that I've gone over the legalities, um, we can actually look at the digital collections. So then you just click on this little browse button here. And here it is in all its glory. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was uh, developing and designing this digital collection, I had to think about a lot of different aspects. I had to think about um, the geographic scope of this digital collection and what collections um, what archives collections would pertain to that geographic scope. And so we primarily focused on the shoreline around the bay, because as you saw earlier in the presentation, the watershed is enormous, and we could not necessarily envelop all of that within our collections or during this first grant period. Um, so I had to think about that, the geographic scope of the collection, what was feasible to complete during this year-long process. But I also had to think about um, how, who the users were and how they would search across this collection. Because like I was mentioning earlier, um, this is bringing together a parts of a bunch of different physical collections. So it's not just one collection, it's a bunch of different archival collections that are brought together under this Green Bay Estuary umbrella. So I had to think about how they would navigate this digital collection. Um, so I had to think about the NER designation staff, like Emily. I had to think about our partners, the Wisconsin DNR. I had to think about faculty at various universities and their students, as well as teachers um, at secondary schools and primary schools. And I also had to think about the local community, the person who would want to look at this collection and remember what the Bay was like back in his childhood. Um, so I had to consider all those different things while I was developing this collection. Um, so when I was doing that, I developed these things called facets. Um, so this was designed to easily be searched across using facets, which act as filters and improve navigation in the digital collection. Um, they are built from controlled vocabularies, as we say in the library world, or subject headings, which are specific words and phrases that are used to describe, organize, and retrieve content. Um, there are five facets in this digital collection that I can show you. There is date, geographic location, and, and they're on the left-hand side, by the way. <laughs> geographic location, county, format, and subjects. Um, so then 
I can show you now how to use these facets to search across the digital collection. Um, so let's say that we are searching changes to the Fox River over time, which as a librarian and archivist, I know that is a very broad research topic, but bear with me here. So let's just say we're um, looking at changes to the Fox River over time. So you can actually go over and navigate to the geographic location facets um, and find Fox River. Because as you can see here, there are a lot of different geographic locations. Um, and sorry for everyone that's watching if I'm giving you motion sickness. Um, <laughs> But there's a lot of different locations that were included in this digital collection. Um, unfortunately, they're not displayed in alphabetical order. Um, they are organized by the amount of instances of that specific subject heading that occur within the digital collection. So, oops, sorry about that. So luckily for us, though, the Fox River is uh, at the very top here with 216 instances across the digital collection. So we can click on that. Yep. And the results will show everything in the digital collection that pertains to the Fox River. Um, so then let's say that we want to narrow this a bit because there is 216 items that pertain to the Fox River in this digital collection. And that's a lot to look through. So since we're trying to look at changes to the Fox River over time, I think that looking at some aerial images would serve our research purposes very nicely. So what we can do is we can actually navigate over here to the format facet and choose aerial photographs. And now your results are narrowed down to aerial photographs and, Fox, and the Fox River. So that's all it's showing. And it took it from 216 results to 49, which I think is a little more a little easier to navigate. Um, so then the other really cool thing about this digital collection is how deeply it searches into the records. Um, and so I can show you what I mean by that. So let's say we jump around here and we want to look at Brown County aerials from 1967. So then this record contains hundreds of aerials that were taken in Brown County in 1967. So it's, so basically what this digital collection is telling me is that there are aerials in this record about the Fox River. Um, so basically then what you do is it's telling you which ones are relevant by highlighting them in red. Um, and also down in the descriptions, it's highlighting your search terms in the object as well as item descriptions here. Another really nice feature when you're looking at these records is you can actually filter out all the other aerial photographs in this record and just have it display ones that are relevant to your Fox River search. And to do that, you can navigate over here and click this filtered button, and then all you'll have are these beautiful aerials of the Fox River, um, which I think is really great, especially because as I was saying before, there are 1,500 aerials in this collection. So this is a nice way to be able to navigate across those by a specific geographic location. So now if we back out of here, and we can actually, if we want to start fresh with a new search, you can actually just click up here under search terms and actually delete your search terms. And we can start with a fresh search. Um, so let's say that we are interested in researching the old Pulliam power plant, which was a power plant that was located near the mouth of the Fox River. Like maybe we're interested in the impacts that it had on the Fox River um, back in the day. So what we can do is we can actually type in a, something as simple as Pulliam in the search bar up here. And it's going to bring up images. Um, as well as oral history interviews that pertain to the Pulliam power plant. And so I'm actually going to loop back to something I was mentioning earlier, which are the transcriptions that are with each of the oral history interviews in this digital collection. So let's say, let's click on this one, for instance, this interview with Patrick and Michael Farrow, which are two brothers um, from the Green Bay area. So what's amazing about this is that the full transcript is available, as well as the audio up here. And additionally, you can actually navigate to specific parts in the transcript that are mentioning that Pulliam power plant by using this arrow to navigate. 
So then it'll jump you down through the transcript and show you the exact timestamp right here of where they start talking about the Polian power plant. And then what you can do is you can take that timestamp, navigate back up to your audio, and find that. So then you can go up here, navigate to that 1649, and then you can play it and listen to that part of the interview. And the other beautiful thing is, is you don't necessarily even need to listen to the interview if you don't want to. You can just read the entire transcript itself. So there's two ways that you can really access this information. Um, additionally, in this record, uh, there were some images that were donated along with the oral history interview. So it's not only showing us that the oral history interview talks about the polling power plant, but it's also showing us over here on the right hand side that there is an image that pertains to the Polian power plant. So if we click on this, it reveals a very, very young Patrick Farrell with his very first trap muskrat standing in front of the Polian <laughs> power plant back in the 1940s. <laughs> and finally, the other thing I want to show you is something kind of along similar lines to the transcripts. Um, and that is timestamps with the home videos. So I'm going to use our nice little facets. First, I'll clear out of the search. Navigate over to our facets. Click on video recordings. And these are all the home videos that were digitized and added to this digital collection. So then what you can do is you can look at these, choose which one you want to view. Um, I think I want to view this Bay of Green Bay footage from 1946. And then when you navigate down, we have timestamps and descriptions, because these, all these videos are silent, so there's no sound. So we provided descriptions um, so you could nav more easily navigate to the parts of these videos that you would like to watch. So let's say, for instance, that I'm really interested in watching some people wa wakeboard um, on a motorboat, mo motorboat in the Bay of Green Bay. I can go to that three minute, 18 second mark on this video. Load. And that's not it. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> and you can watch people wakeboarding on the bay in the 1940s, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> And that is the digital collection. Um, I just want to say that it was such a privilege to work on this digital collection. I also want to give out a shout out to our donors who donated materials to this digital collection. Without them, it wouldn't be as rich as it is. And I also want to give a shout out to my digital, digitization assistants. I had a small team of very, very dedicated workers. And we would not have been able to get all this work done without them. Um, they helped me identify local areas, um, so then we could get that really nice data on each one of these aerial images, and they just did so much amazing work, so I want to give a shout out to them as well. And now I'm going to pass it on to Emily again, so thank you. Every chance I get, I need to publicly thank and say how much in awe I am of the work Hannah did. I was absolutely blown away at how much work she got done in one year. So it was just, every time I see the collection, I'm just so proud of it. I want to talk about, so we just launched this collection a month ago, about a month ago. About a month ago. And how we envision some of the users using it and how we're already using it now. So for example, how we're using it now. I mentioned I have, uh, we have a partner at the Wisconsin DNR, Bree. One thing that caught my eye is she, one of the, I think it was the tank, one of the oral histories, she noted that there was pike, that there was uh, oral history or uh, interview, we was talking about pike along the, um, an area of this restoration area. That's something that she didn't know historically that had, there had been pike there. So now they can help rebuild habitat to kind of encourage the, those pike to go up the river and spawn there. That type of knowledge that we can re kind of design projects towards this historical state is so exciting. Uh, I mentioned that we're working on a this NERD designation, this National Estuarine Research Reserve designation. As part of that we have to write an environmental impact statement and talk about the cultural and historical 
um, perspectives of the Bay from early kind of pre prehistory times. Mike Grimm, who I've been working with on the, from the Nature Conservancy, he's been using this collection to look at to kind of go back deep in history to understand what some of these areas looked like um, before before kind of recent history. We the city of Green Bay is trying to bring back a swimming beach at at Bay Beach. Uh, which hasn't had a swimming beach for some time. These images of people swimming there are great reference points for the city to use as they go about this campaign and this fundraising effort and the science effort to kind of bring back this beach. So we hope that some of these uses uh, have kind of, have, there's broad use beyond just these groups. Uh, we see students using them, the NGOs, private landowners, just those interested in, in the history of the area. All of those are kind of great potential uses. Um, for this phase of the project, we really prioritized areas of concern around the, the AOC area and the NER designation. But as Hannah talked about, the archives collection is really large and it has a quite big geographic footprint. We see that this collection will help immediately inform the AOC habitat restoration work and have kind of cultural, economic, historical value as we talk about this history and plan for our future. But our vision for this collection, so we kind of finished one year of funding, we're in a little bit of a lull as we apply for more funding, is to really expand and have material across that whole Green Bay watershed footprint. So um, with future funding, we would certainly expand the digitization effort, prioritizing kind of moving outward from the estuary to priority sub-watersheds. We want to do more outreach to promote the collection. This is our, I think, our third kind of public outreach event in the last month, talking about the collection, sharing information. We want to do some targeted work with uh, community groups, libraries, other archives that might use and, and network themselves to this one. Uh, we hope to have some more focused community scanathons. So in this audience, if you yourself have material about the Green Bay estuary or the Green Bay watershed, we'd love to connect with you and explore a possibility of including in one of our future scanathons. And then I think this will be really critical is we want our, our Green Bay Estuary Digital Collection to be, to be connected to other estuaries or other digital collections around the state that house material about the Bay of Green Bay. Uh, that could be with the Wisconsin Historical Society, the, the Coastal Management Program, which we know has lots of mapping and old map data, uh, the Door County Maritime Museum or the Maritime Museum in Manitowoc, the Wisconsin Li Water Library at Sea Grant here at the Madison campus, others. And our, our goal really is to um, have a digital home to be all materials about the Green Bay watershed, maybe eventually the whole Lake Michigan watershed, to be connected back uh, at one digital, one digital space. I personally, there, I know that the collection, um, our collection holds a, a, diary, a diary of a lighthouse keeper, one of the last, I think the last diary of a lighthouse keeper for a lighthouse structure that still is kind of crumbling but exists in the bay. I love to make that more accessible, maybe feature it in future NER programming. And really, we want um, this collection to be a front door for researchers and others to learn more about, about the Green Bay Estuary and then to be connected with kind of future and current work happening around the estuary. So we kind of, well, yeah, we thank you for your time and attention. If you want to have questions about the collection, consider talking to our archivist about material you might have that might fit our collection. The archive's email address is on the screen. Uh, for more information about the Bay of Green Bay NER designation that I mentioned, there's our website link is there. And then to uh, orient yourself and to explore the digital collection, also have a website there too. And we can, of course, provide those to you separately when the, when the talk is over. But really, we want to just encourage you to go out and explore and use this collection and, and make it kind of useful to the work you're doing, to the community research you might do, to other folks you know who might be interested in, in the Green Bay system. Thank you. Repeat the question. 
So you're asking if we did any sort of geolocation on archival images um, that are included in the digital collection. Um, no, I did not. <laughs> that was something I had thought about actually a little bit, but I wasn't sure even where to start with that. But I think that could be a really cool idea for like future funding. Um, and one of my future ideas for this is to actually create an interactive map where people can click on an area and then it'll bring up all the archival, digitized archival materials about that area up for them to research. So that's like a long goal for me, but that's something I think would be really cool to do. And I'm sure some of that geospatial stuff would really help with that goal. Uh, who is the Coffrin Arboretum named in honor of? Um, Austin Coffrin. Oh yeah, who is that? So they, they asked who the, um, Coffrin Memorial Arboretum was named after, and it was named after Austin Coffrin, um, who was a large businessman in Green Bay, and I believe he started for Howard, actually. The paper? The paper company. Okay. Many parts of our Green Bay campus have the Coffrin name attached to it. Yes. Yeah. Was he any relation to Doug Coffrin? I don't know. <laughs> I'd, have to, I'd have to look that up for you. <laughs> Luckily, she's a librarian. <laughs> <laughs> You ask the right person. <laughs> so if I have my uh, phone and I'm up at Green Bay, which I'll be there tomorrow, uh, the game not for the day. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of alluding to your question. Can I just, if I'm at a place like it, uh, is it called Bay Beach? Bay Beach, if yes. If I were to type in Bay Beach, would a whole bunch of stuff pop up then and then I can look at it on my phone while I'm there at Bay Beach? Yeah, so he asked whether or not if, um, if he was at, in Green Bay at Bay Beach and if he had his phone and was looking at the digital collection and typed in Bay Beach, would a bunch of different images and archival um, materials pull up about Bay Beach? And the answer is yes. Um, actually, there's some really, really uh, amazing postcard images of people swimming and doing recreational activities at Bay Beach, which you don't see anymore. Um, so I think those are really fascinating images. Um, and there's also aerials of Bay Beach and a bunch of other different types of materials about that area. So yes, you could actually, you could give yourself a little tour around Green Bay using the digital collection. I think that'd be fun. These, these kind of, these home videos, these um, images of people recreating, I think are so especially valuable as the city and the region is really trying to get back to a place where the water's clean enough to recreate in, uh, you can do more fishing, more water activities with kind of clean, decontaminated water, that we have these reference points for um, what, that it, it wasn't that long ago that you could swim and fish and kind of drink that water really easily. It's so encouraging that we can yeah, direct people to this archive and say, look, this was a thing that we did not that long ago. It's great to have images of that as for our kind of navigational moving us forward with restoration. So actually in this, repeat the oh, sorry, I keep forgetting <laughs> to do that, my bad. Um, so she was asking if the digital collection is tailored towards middle and high school students. Um, so I think yes, because I try to make this accessible to everyone. And actually this coming spring, I'll be giving a little talk to some high school students about this digital collection and to a teacher who wants to use it in their classroom. So absolutely, 100% use this with high school and middle school students. I think you should, yeah. And then give us feedback. Yes. About how we might make <laughs> it a little bit better or improve it. Um, is there any reason why you decided to make the Yeah, the question was why did uh, these um, images, these watershed images, and the NER designation, why does it stop at the Wisconsin-Michigan border? So this designation, this NER designation, um, is a Wisconsin state initiative. And so the geographic footprint is for within the Wisconsin waters of the Green Bay waterway. But we know that water does not know state boundaries. So programmatically, we'll be working with um, the UP. And it actually will be the, a NER reserve for all of Lake Michigan. 
So we've right now focused our geographic footprint on the Wisconsin waters, but programmatically it'll be broader. And if we have a chance to expand the collection, we would certainly do the full watershed, which goes into Michigan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are just arbitrary state boundaries, not water boundaries, <laughs> certainly. So to bring another state in, I noticed uh, from the Duluth newspaper that there's an argument over which of the two estuaries is larger, the St. Louis River estuary <laughs> coming out at Duluth Superior or the mm -hmm. Bay estuary. The question was, <laughs> which is... <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> a comment on which is the larger freshwater estuary, uh, the Duluth Superior one or the Green Bay one. I was asked for a quote, I think in that, maybe that's the article you're thinking of in the Duluth paper. I mean, I'm going to have to say it was the Green Bay estuary. We're going to, we've, we stand by that. It was in the International Journal of Great Lakes Research. Um, it kind of depends on how you scale it. Are you looking at watershed or water in the, in the bay? Either way, we're both important, massive Great Lakes systems, lots of shared knowledge and research happening, lots of common um, challenges and solutions. So it might be Green Bay, but we're collaborators. Way to go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's my impression there wasn't really a lot of uh, like land filling to make new land to build out onto. Is that, is that correct? It's just more uh, clean up and restoration. Uh, the question was, uh, the impression from these images, but it hadn't been a lot of landfilling. It has mostly been cleanup and restoration. There's one actually big landfilling product of sorts, which is the Cat Island chain. This is really interesting. So this is a historical barrier island chain existed in the bay, a naturally forming island chain, in the late 60s, early 70s, because of a combination of high water levels, uh, ice, big ice winter storm events, and um, the way the shoreline had been changed, there was like a lot of high energy, those islands disappeared. They just like, the water rose and there's no more islands. And those were really significant barrier islands to protect shoreline in Green Bay from the really intense wave action that comes across from uh, North, uh, Northern Lake Michigan waters. Uh, through this kind of, uh, over time, there was a recognition that those islands were significant ecologically and important barrier islands. And meanwhile, the, the Port of Green Bay was looking for a place to put their dredge spoils, that clean dredge spoils. So they've, over since about early 90, or early 2000, they've been rebuilding these islands to create new habitat in the bay, to recreate these Cat Island chain. And immediately it's become a habitat for piping plovers, which is a federally endangered uh, species of little tiny shorebirds. And there's a lot of other restoration things that are happening. This is a 50-year restoration project. So while most of the shoreline's mostly been just kind of restoration and cleanup, that is an area of like building up land that historically was there. And a really cool uh, restoration and dredging kind of port activity joint success story. And what's really cool with the digital collection is you can actually see through the aerial images those islands recede and fade over time, but you can also see what they used to look like so those can be used as part of that restoration process. And hopefully over time now we'll see them rebuild and rebuild and yes. rebuild. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be possible to um, invite the students to ask their parents, grandparents, extended family for items that they could add to your collection? And since I work for Wisconsin 4-H, this might also, and photography is one of the biggest statewide projects in 4-H, um, being able to digitize old photos, old video, So the question was about when making uh, visits to middle schools, um, whether we could talk to the students and have them talk to their parents, their grandparents, their other family members about donating materials or interviews, um, historical materials about the Green Bay Estuary. And 100%, I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, and we would absolutely want to encourage those students to talk to their families about this digital collection and say, hey, like, 
Grandpa, I heard that you used to do a bunch of fishing in the Fox River. Can you talk to these archivists? Can you talk to these people about your experiences? We can save that and preserve that information into the future. So I think that would be a wonderful idea. And we can do those kind, that kind of community scanathon idea with those students and their families as well. Hannah, can I ask you a question? Yeah, ask me a question. <laughs> Is there a collection or a, a, a kind of a hole that we particularly would want to fill with community collections? Ooh. That is a really good question. Um, so I'd love to see more. So as you might guess, this is a very visual collection right now. Um, and there's some oral history interviews and some home videos, um, but it's a lot of photographs, a lot of maps. Um, so what I love to see is like a fisherman's log of the fish that he was catching in the Bay or the Fox River, mm -hmm. to have that kind of data represented in this digital collection. I love to see more oral history interviews um, in this digital collection. Um, I'd love to hear from uh, diverse voices, because um, right now it's very, um, let me think. It's just there, there are only certain voices that are being carried through this collection. So I'd love to diversify the voices that are in this collection. So I think there's a lot of a lot that I'd love to do with the community scanathons moving forward. Any other questions? If not, thank you oh. very, very much. Oh. <laughs>